Our next speakers are um, Kenny Ruman and Duncan Shepard from Jaunt VR. They're going to show a really amazing project, as if everything else hasn't been amazing so far. So check it out. Well, first of all, even though it's nearly happy hour, there's unfortunately no food in this, as far as I can recall, or wine, <laughs> or any beauty shots like that. But um, this is sort of, I guess, where all this really amazing technology um, the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Uh, quick intros for ourselves. Uh, I basically am uh, in charge of all content and production for John internationally from our office in London. And Duncan here hey there. is uh, one of our lead editors and probably has pushed the boundaries of what we do in terms of telling immersive stories, um, certainly. Uh, he works out of our studio in Los Angeles. So you've got the Brit in LA and the American working out of London. Um, we're gonna show you a little behind the scenes. This is a series that uh, Jaunt was commissioned to do for one of our clients, in this case, the Olympic Channel. Um, they had a, a sort of problem with the Olympics, which is that they happen every two years. And in between then, um, people sort of lose interest, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of the digital content today tends to be sort of disposable. Uh, you watch it, you watch it quickly, or it's very niche. Um, so they were looking for a solution that would keep interest in the games alive between the games. And also, you know, how do you reach a younger generation, an audience that you know, is growing up with YouTube and, and finding things digitally, um, as more of the sort of older traditional audience um, you know, is, is not watching broadcast anymore. So they decided to invest in a 360 series. Um, so let's show the quick uh, preview of it. My name is Corey Rich. I was the director on the Olympic Channel's first ever virtual reality original series. What we're about to share with you is a behind the scenes look at what it takes to shoot a film in VR in the run up to the 2018 Olympic Winter Games. We have nine bags. This is kind of the story of our lives. Lots of movement, lots of gear, carnet lists, jaunt cameras, key mission cameras, all the mounting equipment, and going from cold to warm, back to cold, back to warm through airports. Shooting in 360 or virtual reality is a whole new paradigm in terms of storytelling. Now the viewer has control. The viewer decides in which direction they look. That was super cool. The tour continues, stop number 73. We are now in Somewhere in Canada, I think Whistler. We just arrived at the market in Nigeria. We made it to Lavinia, Italy. Just arrived in Montreal. We're in South Lake Tahoe, California. Here we are, Slovenia. Early morning in Switzerland. Tell us. Let's hide. The challenge of virtual reality always is getting the camera in a unique position and then getting out of the way hiding and crossing your fingers that you're actually getting something. monitoring Max in the hallway. This is kind of the best scenario for VR. We need to start installing these on all the doors. All of us are really pioneering in the world of shooting in virtual reality. This is a new technology. This is really the cutting edge. I always remind myself that you have to be tireless. You just keep on shooting, keep on pushing, because the more you capture, the more energy, the more enthusiasm you channel toward the project, the better the footage the better the story. Uh, yeah, it, it was not an easy shoot, to say the least, but, um, but it, it's paying off. The series just came out January 4th, and it's already uh, picked up an award. It was nominated for two, and it picked up the Film Production Award, which is great. Um, yeah, so basically, I mean, you know, we, we partnered with the Olympic Channel in, the big challenge was how do you draw an audience into a piece of immersive content, a series like this? There aren't a lot of series done in VR yet, so we're sort of creating this as we go. Um, we leaned basically on talent in sort of casting, if you can call it that, for the series, 
one of the things that I was looking for were really compelling stories. And there were the obvious choices. Jamie Anderson, who won gold in Sochi, she came on board the series as our female snowboarder. Max Perot joined us um, from Canada. At the time, he hadn't done an Olympics yet, but he ended up just winning gold in Pyeongchang. We also uh, found a pair of alpine skiers, a pair of uh, speed skaters. All of this, you can imagine, in 360 video just makes incredibly insane content and footage and, and a thrilling experience when you actually watch this in a headset. But the Nigerian bobsleigh team were just someone, it, it was a team that I found about a year ago, just over a year ago, and they really had minimal press. I think I was sitting in a Starbucks working, doing this deck uh, in Keynote. Uh, we did the pitch deck. Um, this is from the, the pitch deck in Keynote. And I think I, I just found this team, and that was sort of one of the, the creative things that pushed this whole series over the line. And once the you know, Olympics heard about them, uh, everybody was sort of just all in, and they said, yes, let's do this. We want to uh, you know, get on a bobsleigh, capture all that. Uh, then, of course, the challenge is, well, how are we gonna do that? John, make a camera that's ours on the left, but it's got 24 lenses, weighs about 20 pounds. You're not gonna put that on a bobsleigh. The one we use to capture that is on the right, the Nikon Key Mission. We use a multitude of other cameras. You may recognize the Insta360 Pro, a Nokia Ozo. Um, all of them capture 360. Some of them capture stereo, which means it's in 3D. So when you're watching in a headset, it really feels like you're there in the room with people. Uh, and we flew the DJI Inspire. Um, on, on a bunch of the snowboarding shots. We decided not to try to show it here because it's really best in an immersive headset experience. But what we do have prepared, uh, Duncan has prepared some demos as to how we took all this footage. Okay, uh, let me just switch over to the uh, final cut machine. See if this works. Great, okay. So uh, I just wanted to present this as a way to show everybody that it's, this is stuff is actually quite easy to get started with, virtual reality editing or 360 editing, it shouldn't be, uh, uh, shouldn't be seen as being too complicated to get into. So I just wanted to walk everybody through just a couple of basic or you know, some techniques that we use and uh, uh, just give you some ammunition to get started. It might move a bit fast but we can always, um, you know, I, I've got some screen shows and stuff like that we can sort of distribute later. But uh, anyway, here we go. Um, the first thing to do is to create a project uh, using uh, the usual techniques. If you go into custom settings, and let's just call this uh, One Big Air, I think, which is what the, uh, we called it. Uh, in settings, there's a 360 setting, which will uh, give you some uh, of the sort of, well, two of the more normal options for resolution. Our project was done in uh, stereoscopic, sort of over under stereo. So um, we will set it for stereo, and we worked at 3840 by 3840. Uh, very important at this stage to get the frame rate right, as you know with Final Cut, if you get the frame rate wrong initially you can't change it in the sequence, so you have to get that right when you start break making it. This was a PAL delivery, so we set it at uh, 50p. Um, uh, stereoscopic. I normally work, when I'm doing an offline, I'll work at 422LT, just because there's no point going HQ when I'm just working and rendering for myself. So that's good enough to get started with. Uh, there we go, one big air. Now, um, I pulled up some footage that I just pulled off the Jaunt server, just to start playing with some shots for ourselves. Uh, and I think that, uh, let's just clear all of these. Uh, um, basically, if I start putting in uh, shots, as you can see, uh, we've got a guy on an uh, uh, exercise bicycle in Ekarek, and there's a shot of him coming through the door at some point. Here we go. Uh, if I put that one into the timeline, and the shot of him on the bicycle. Inside the timeline, because Final Cut doesn't know that these are Ecorex shots yet, it's displaying them as if they're a regular 2D video. So you need to tell the system that it is uh, looking at um, uh, VR footage in, in a sense. So if I select all of these shots and then go to the inspector, uh, there will be uh, an option to adjust the 3D projection mode and the stereoscopic mode. So if I adjust all of these to Ecorectangular, and then change monoscopic to over under, which is the, uh, the, the way that our footage was displayed and captured. Now, if I put uh, the shot of the kid walking in, and this is one of our snowboarders. It's Max Perot. Max Perot. 
Uh, now that will display correctly as an over under. And if I go to the 360 viewer, which is a very important tool for us to uh, play with in uh, 360 editing, you can see that he's, uh, he's properly rendered in that way. So that's quite a key component. Sometimes your footage won't come up properly metadated, uh, so you can recognize it as um, uh, uh, 360 or VR. Um, then one of the techniques we used in this show was we had these two athletes. Max Perot is a bit of a machine. He, uh, he's always in the gym, he's training on trampolines. Um, and uh, the, his uh, sort of co-collaborator, Jamie Anderson, who is another Olympic athlete, she's much more of a sort of hippie, dippy, sort of kind of grew up in Colorado, was homeschooled. She's very kind of very different uh, uh, attitude towards her whole training regimen. And we wanted to present that juxtaposition between the two of them uh, by showing the different ways that they worked out. So very briefly, if I put in uh, another shot of Max, so we've got him walking into the gym and he's on the exercise bicycle. And then if I pick some of Jamie's shots, we've got her doing yoga in her gym. I think I've got one of her just uh, starting off. So if I start uh, there, let's say, and put her on the, um, on the connect, that's connected clip. And then let's pull this in a little bit. Oops. And then pull in another shot of Jamie doing uh, that, that move. Let's get that in there. Pardon me for messing up the in and the out point. But, uh, let's get it right now. Uh, okay, get rid of those two errors. <coughs> All right, I'll just do it with this one shot. Okay, one of the things we did, we, we were doing split screen. So um, the way that we achieve that is using the regular uh, masking tool that uh, comes pre-packaged with Final Cut. Even though it's a uh, stereoscopic uh, image, we can still, if we're trying to present uh, two halves of, or, or split the world into two halves, have one thing happening on one side of the world and one thing happening on the other side of the world, we can use the tools that are already in Final Cut uh, just to split those two worlds up. So if I just show you what we are talking about here, if I shrink this mask down to that, extend it past the boundaries of the top and bottom and make it more square. Now, when I spin round in the viewer, I've got Max's gym on one side and Jamie's gym on the other. So she's got her kind of, uh, she's doing a yoga pose in the middle. Um, that's fairly basic, don't worry about that. Uh, then, um, obviously, in this view, uh, Max on his exercise bicycle is obscured by Jamie. Um, but currently, or in the last, not the last, in, in the four point, in the 10.4 update of Final Cut, uh, um, they introduced the uh, on-screen controls for the reorient tool. So if I select this little tool down here, this little wheel, uh, basically I can grab either Jamie and move and change her orientation uh, like that, I'm going to undo that, or in this case I want to grab Max because he's the one that's missing. And I can grab him. And if I want, if I want to, prove, basically, what this is doing is tilting the apparent view of the camera, left the sort of yaw and tilt. But if I want to constrain it, I can hold down the uh, the shift key and start moving around like this. And usually, you'll find if you've got, um, uh, you know, we live in rectangular and square spaces, so there's usually some fairly uh, obvious lines of parallax that will cross over. So if you look at the, um, uh, let me just bring this one around here. If you look at the floor. The floorboards themselves. So if I pick it there, they're sort of the, the lines on the floorboards are kind of crossing over between the two viewpoints, uh, so that we've got a reasonably good match on the floor there between Max and Jamie's uh, situation. So that was one of the techniques that we used. That you can see, I mean, it's taken me like a couple of minutes to organise that. You could do that with lots of different things. It's another way to present juxtaposition in filmmaking that is that, that is analogous to just doing cuts or, or that sort of. Um, uh, a way to present a sequence of events, but I, personally I find it quite compelling and interesting to be able to split screen between views like this. So that was one of the techniques that we did. Um, the next thing that came up with this project was that we were using uh, different types of cameras and one of the things that happened to us because we were using different types of cameras was that um, uh, we were using, step the jaw camera is a big stereo camera, it's got 24 modules on it, it's a very sophisticated piece of equipment. It's, requires stitching, it's similar to the, uh, there's, a, there's a Google jump platform, there's the same things, it comes out of the, the box uh, in stereo. 
But because we did a lot of action photography, we also used little key missions. You can also get these GoPro cameras that Steve was talking about with. Um, they will produce a mono image. And when you try and inject uh, a mono uh, scene into uh, the stereo view, if I find one of these uh, shots, and here we go. Right. Uh, here I've got some uh, shots that are shot from the Nikon Key Mission. I've got a great shot of Jamie zooming down the slope about to hit the ramp, and then another one of her flying over the ramp from a different angle. I've got uh, a handheld shot of Jamie actually riding the snowboard, and we have an aerial drone shot. Um, if I was to put in this shot of Jamie into our stereo timeline, it will present like that, because I didn't, I didn't do the, uh, the Ecorec fix that we did to the, pre the other stereo shots. If I now take these shots and go over to the inspector and set the, the projection mode to Ecorectangular, but leave it monoscopic because these cameras are monoscopic, and then drop one of those shots in, this will happen. You get a warning saying you're trying to drop a monoscopic media into a stereoscopic project and it will do it, but it will present it like this, where the footage doesn't render correctly. You can see what's going on in the 360 view. It's got a weird split. These two images, they shouldn't have, basically shouldn't look like that. Um, so we found a slightly hacky solution to this, which uh, you may or may not want to go down this road, but it's very useful. If lots of projects we get these days do have stereo and mono kind of mixes, it's becoming a very common sort of facet of some of the sort of productions that we're doing. So the way that we got around that problem was to open this clip up and start meddling around with the data inside it. That sounds a little bit more serious than it actually is. If you go into open clip, you are presented with what's inside what we call the primordial clip. If you, this is, just, I'm just going to give you the recipe without doing too much explanation, but basically, if you go into transform on that clip and you scale the Y dimension to 50% of its original height, you get, oh, I've missed a step, hang on, I'm just going to go back one level. Uh, I should say, before I do all of that, I need to trick Final Cut into thinking that these are over-under clips. So it was already set to echo rectangular, I'm going to set it to over-under. So now it's presenting them as little square clips, but they're all slightly, they're just messed up. They're not the right uh, projection. So if I take my um, zooming down the hill shot and go to open clip, and now I've got my uh, clip here. And then if I then scale the Y dimension, which is the height, to 50%, it does that, which is nearly right, but not quite right. But if I then knock the position up to 25%, now that's right. Um, normally I'd call that uh, good and done. If I then sort of go over here and drop this shot into my timeline, now it feels like it's working. But if I go into the reorient controls, one side will go, that'll it'll start, it, it'll basically mess it up. So we go back into the, this is, this is the, the full solution, if you like. Go back into open the clip. And the thing that you have to do is you have to duplicate this piece of media, the, the, the video side of it, and essentially you're trying to package it so that what it, it, the, the, the projection system can see it both in the top and the bottom half of its projection when it's providing the stereo. So if I hold down option and drag, that will duplicate the clip, and I'm going to make the bottom one have a position of minus 25, so that it mirrors the top one. And then now, if I drop this in, <coughs> my reorient controls will work. So now, if I did that to all of my mono footage, which it sounds like it's a lot of work, but once you start mechanizing your little workflows, you can, I did like 100 shots in a couple of hours, and it makes the whole process much, much easier. You haven't got to render everything out, bring it back in, or do any kind of like super complicated uh, workflow stuff. So that is a, uh, I don't know how long that's going to be supported by Final Cut. I mean, you know, it's, it's a sort of a hacky thing, but definitely got us out of lots and lots and lots of problems. Um, I'm not going to go through and do the same thing to the other clips right now because I think we're running out of time and I really want to hear all the other people too. Um, the last thing that I, or one of the last things I was going to show everybody was, or two things really. One of them is um, Final Cut's ability to project uh, 2D footage back into this sort of stuff. It is often the case with sports, sports content that you've got acres and acres and acres of archive footage, with none of which has been shot in VR. But it's all amazing footage. Um, we are always looking for ways to integrate this sort of stuff into our shows. Um, as it happens, um, it's very, very easy. You just uh, oops, drop it on top, and it automatically. Hold on a second. 
second. Excuse me, whilst I set this clip itself up to be projected correctly. Somehow I missed that. There we go, that's better. Okay, so, uh, so if I find one of my Jamie snowboarding slow motion shots that we uh, ripped off from uh, CBS or NBC, somewhere like that, that's a nice one. Just drop that in on top. It's automatically projected as if it was like a, 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 a big, a, you know, big cinema screen, basically in front of you. If you want to make it a little bit smaller, uh, you can just start messing with the uh, uh, distance control on that. You can make it feel like it's further away. Um, if you're in stereo space, you would want to be messing with the convergence. You'd want to do this with a headset on, basically, which all that's doing is moving the two halves sort of in opposite directions, so that it now feels closer to me than the background. Uh, if you want to put something on like that, like, that, like a soft edge mask. That's relatively simple. You can see it says to use on-screen controls, turn off 360 transform. If we do that, we get our normal masking tools back and I can find the true edge of that image, top and bottom. I can take it to there, then I can run the feather inside that, turn the transform back on. So that's a very, very, very quick and easy way just to sort of plant 2D footage inside VR shows. And you can animate that, you can move them all around the image, you can put them up on the top and put them down the bottom. That's super powerful for us. The last thing that I wanted to show you, which I find also highly amazing, is the titling. If you want to put in, we're always putting titles into our VR shows, whether they're subtitles or whether the main title sequence or there's something else. Um, this uh, iteration of Final Cut is a very sophisticated rendering engine for sticking titles in. Um, you can see that it's already put, it, it's already projecting it correctly. That's a 3D tumble. I personally would uh, be wanting this one to be. Jamie Anderson's name there, she said. Jamie, J-A-M-I-E. Okay, that's our athlete. Um, I would like it to tumble past me towards uh, the, the, the point where it's going to arrive, so we will change this setting here for tumble zoom down, and let's have them ease both. Um, and that will give me uh, a title which will start behind me, in theory, and land at the front. Now, what I wanted was it started behind me. As you can see, it actually starts right in front of my nose. One of the things to bear in mind when you are staging some of these animated titles in uh, Final Cut Pro is that it's useful to adjust the Z positioning uh, so that the, if I take us back to the beginning again, so that the point that the titles start animating is behind us. So if I do that, and run the whole thing forwards. You can see now it's coming from behind your head. That's where the titles are actually starting from, rather than in front of us. So that's just like one little tip that we worked out. And that's it. That's the, that's the sum total of all the things that I've done.